Poosh, an old Persian word meaning cloth, has become one of several clothing brands launched in modern Iran in the past five years. After the revolution of 1979, women's street wear in Iran came down to two relatively drab choices to be matched with a demure wearer. The shador, or superior hijab, and the manteau, an overcoat designed to conceal a woman's body shape, became the default wardrobe in Iran's public places. But the women's mildly disaffected campaign against the hijab, or shawl, quickly manifested in more creative and alluring dress choices that pushed the strict religious codes. The Push brand today, for instance, advertises as a contemporary fashion dealer that purportedly is registered as a brand approved by authorities and the Ministry of Culture itself. It is a false imagination in the West that Persian women face limitation in the color of their clothing. Iranians call this impression given in movies and the media utter nonsense. Of course there is a tendency for especially older women in conservative enclaves and towns like Mashhad and Qom to gravitate to dark colored clothing. I saw them often. However, Iranian girls display designer brights and neons nearly everywhere. Many wear a loose, narrow scarf, allowing wisps of hair to frame their face. Untied hair shows from the back. Some wear heavy makeup. Shops in Iran are stuffed with skinny jeans and tights, and as one native travel agency states, Iranian girls don't show any intimidation in wearing them, so why should you? Iranian men of conservative persuasion indeed do wear black clothes pants and shirt, often without a tie, when engaged in religious devotional activities, but on the street their lives imitate a motorcycle culture of casual and suggestive. Women and men flirt on the edges of established custom, as might be expected almost anywhere else in the world. Western men, as I alluded to previously, are especially prized captures for the more adventurous and mostly educated urban females. Women occupy more than half the university seats in the country and certainly are very socially active and economically more independent than Western reporters give them credit for. The allure of Iran's women, their perfumes and the colorful patterns of their clothing and home appliances, after all carries on today in alignment with the mystique of the Orient, facilitated by Iran's pivotal role in the emergence of the Silk Road and the spice and gems flow. Alexander the Great, a young man and master military strategist and conqueror, succumbed to the charms of the Persian courtesans even as he presided over the looting and destruction of Darius's great city of Persepolis and the Magi's Zoroastrian strongholds. Alexander assumed for himself the distinctive King of Kings role and married off his army's officers to Persian women. Sun emblem holding a shamshir remained the official symbol of Iran until the 1979 revolution when it was removed from public spaces and government organizations and replaced by a coat of arms. The lion caricature is part of the oldest historical monument in Tehran, the Golestan Palace, designated a World Heritage Site. It began in the 16th century as a fortress by the Safavids encompassing an extensive garden. The complex used by the Shah for royal events includes the marble throne, created from yellow yazd marble. During the Sabafid era, the lion and sun represented two foundations of Persian society, the state and the Islamic religion. It became the national emblem during the subsequent Qajar era, 1781 to 1925. The lion, of course, is the ancient sign of the sun in the house of Leo, a symbol traced to Babylonian astrology. For the Sabafids, the Shah had two roles, king and holy man. This double meaning was associated with the genealogy of Iranian kings. When the last Shah was removed a few decades ago, the nation became a theocratic democracy. 
In essence, the head was severed and the son was consigned to be carried on the back of the lion. This caricature, intended or not, occasionally appears in the colorful tiles artwork around the nation. I first encountered the lion emblem on a wall that is part of the royal dwellings and offices of the former Shahanshah of Iran, the Shah, his imperial majesty. As usual, I encountered many facets and meanings connected to every symbolism and name attached to the Persian historical personages and locations. The Pahlavi dynasty is one such instance. The Pahlavi dynasty was the ruling house of the imperial state of Iran from 1925 until 1979, when the monarchy was abolished. The lion figure appears throughout Iranian history, extending back to at least the 5th century BC, King Cyrus's and Darius's era. The sun was not always a companion. The bull also is a prominent actor on the Persian stage, and this is very evident in the ancient massive stone cities like Persepolis, a place I visited later during my visit to Iran. Like many of the mosques and palace complexes scattered in the large cities, Tehran's buildings, especially the historical masterpieces, need some polishing. With or without the polish, though, the structures and furniture of these masterful houses of the nation's former powerful are awesome to behold, the Shah's dwellings not accepted. No photography is permitted in some of the most startling locations, but accessible exterior porches and public reception areas present some of the finest artistic impulses this nation's craftspeople have to offer. A magnificent interplay of arches and brick and tile with mirrors and glass, plus abstract and historical depictions are found in every religious center of the country and often in the secular places as well. However, these uncountable displays definitely and often are serious puzzles to solve, requiring either a genius knowledge of Near Eastern or even some classical Western history or resignation to assigning one's own mythical imaginings to the color and design patterns. And so, my first conundrum mentioned here was the ever lurking image of the lion and the scimitar or shamshir. While Tehran has much human drama to keep a first time or umpteenth time visitor entertained, the heart of Iran still beats in the central plateau south of the city. It behooves a visitor to join the heavily traveled freeway, winding along dry washes and barren desert landscapes, past the holy city of Qom to Kashan and Yazd, and to places where vast armies once maneuvered and great kings held court and managed the world's first empire. The highway soon crosses a hot and day, cool at night, arid and windswept land lined with gravel, sand and salt plains with lots of discarded trash. Mixed with empty hills and distant hazy mountains, the Zagros. It is hard for me to imagine that such a place could foster and feed an empire at one time, unless up until a millennium or so ago the climate was perhaps wetter and more welcoming of vegetation. Along the way, Iran's modernization scheme has already been realized in some locations, where so-called rest areas for motorists resemble familial meccas for cool, clean fun and even miniature shopping malls. All sorts of people mingle at these welcome centers, including busloads of European tourists and automobiles transporting city dwellers seeking holiday relaxation. Here in the desert, bereft of trees, is the heart of lightness, where the Persian sun dominated a nearly cloudless sky every day while I passed through. The shrine of Fatima Masume is in Qom, considered by Shia Muslims to be the second most sacred city in Iran after Mashhad. Fatima Masume was the sister of the eighth Imam Riza. Shia women apparently may be revered as saints if they are close relatives to one of the 12er Imams. 
and such shrines of family members outnumber even the holy sites dedicated to the founding Imams themselves throughout Iran. Since the beginning of Qum's history in the 7th century, many authors equate the city with Shiism, set apart from the Sunni Caliphate. About two and a half hours south of Tehran on the Qum Kerman Road, the oasis of Kashan bakes alongside the parched desert. This city town, packed at one time with palatial mansions, was treated by some of the Qajar Shahs as a retreat from the intrigues of the royal suites in the capital. Like so many Near East caravanserais, this city is rich in historical and religious significance that's still being deciphered. Archaeological discoveries nearby indicate this region was one of the primary centers of civilization in prehistoric ages, the so-called Elamite period. And according to legend, the three wise men, or magi, bearing gifts to Jesus, began their journey following the Star of David from this town. Zoroastrian traditions here eventually became submerged under the waves of Arabian Muslims that swept the dust near the end of the 6th century AD. The Imam Zayda Ibrahim is one of the smaller Islamic historical structures in Kashan, and with 20th century enhancements, the shrine displays Persian sensibilities in mirrors, rugs, and tiles. Built in 1894, this mausoleum boasts a conical tiled turquoise roof that is distinctive to this area. I could only marvel at the play of light in a late afternoon sunshine while wandering in stocking feet on rugs and tiles beneath the holy glow of multicolored glitter. Plastic chairs for the caretakers seemed an anomaly and anachronism. Here, despite the ultra-conservative nature of the population, hospitality shown to Americans was relentless and playful. One woman among a clutch of picnicking women ran across the lawn and offered a piece of birthday cake. At an intersection, another young lady rolled down her car's window and handed over small candies with a smile and a brief wave of her hand and then drove away. Observing the natural congeniality among the locals, I relished the seeming normalness of life here and welcomed the peacefulness interrupted only at one point by some women who wanted me to take their picture, then by a cry from a young boy who fell into the water, sluicing from a palace bath. Mother and son shared this moment with relative poise, like any parent and child would anywhere in the world. <laughs> 